Today, the Kanto starters are going head-to-head -head in solo playthroughs of Pokemon Yellow. Which one will emerge victorious? Charizard, the fan favorite, Venusaur, my own personal favorite, or Blastoise, the cool turtle with cannons who I predict will win it all? Let's find out. Before we get into the playthroughs, I have a lot of stuff that I need to explain. First of all, you've probably noticed that this video is extremely long, so just bear with me. There's a lot of stuff that I need to unpack and explain. After all, Generation 1 is really janky and there's a lot of weird stuff going on. I want to make sure that everyone's on the same page, even if you've never watched a Pokemon Challenge video before. It also might be the case that you're more familiar with the modern mechanics of Pokemon, so I'm going to be going into the janky mechanics of Gen 1 a lot in this video. So buckle up and get ready. Here we go. First of all, I'm going to explain the versus format. The goal is to figure out which Pokemon I can beat Pokemon Yellow with the most easily. Just remember though that this video isn't science. However, I do think it's a fun way to get some anecdotal information and form a good hypothesis about which Pokemon is in fact the best for a solo playthrough. I'll explain more in a little bit, so just hang on. The rules for the playthroughs that I'm going to complete are I'll only use my starter in battle, no items in battle, items are allowed outside of battle of course, and to catch flying Pokemon which are required for speedy game completion. No glitches or exploits, with the exception of the badge boost glitch of course. That one's actually really hard to ban and I'll explain it later. No TM32 before level 100. If the Pokemon learns it through level up though, I will allow it. I put this rule in place for a simple reason. Watching Pokemon use double team is just really not engaging and it doesn't create a very good video or a fun playing experience for me. Plus, like every Pokemon in Generation 1 can learn double team and you can buy the TM from Celadon. So, yeah. Basically every Pokemon has access to it, so if your Pokemon's strong, it's going to get a really good time with Double Team. Now I'll explain the metrics that I'm going to use to judge each one of these Pokemon. I want to explain each one of these in depth so that you have a good understanding of what each of them means. Taking any of them in isolation doesn't give you all the information, and each one of them is also flawed in a particular way, so I want to go over that. The first metric that I use to judge these Pokemon is real time. The pros of using real time are that it gives you an accurate sense of how long it took me to complete the playthrough. And then we can use this metric to compare other Pokemon to see which one is actually less of a time commitment to complete. The cons of this metric are that it includes a lot of player error, and specifically those errors made during battles. So whenever you reset, it's including this time in the overall time it took to play the game, because after all, it took you more time, you had to reset once. Another weakness of this metric is that it'll actually skew the results if I was able to proceed past a fight with a lucky win. So say I win because of a critical hit, well now the metric is going to show us a lower time than it would have been if I didn't get that lucky critical hit. However, eliminating luck from a Pokemon playthrough is almost impossible because luck is such a core gameplay component. The second metric that I use to judge Pokemon is game time. So the pros of game time is that it includes less player error. So it excludes all the errors that you reset over. So for example, if you're in a fight and you lose for some reason, you have to reset, the game time also resets with you. So one of the cons of this metric is that it doesn't give an accurate depiction of the time commitment involved in completing the challenge. It removes all the time that you spend resetting or trying things out in different ways and then resetting over it. In that way, you could actually reset until you get the perfect fight on every single battle and get the lowest possible game time. Another weakness of this metric is if you're playing at a higher than one times game speed. For example, I play these challenges at four times game speed, and when I'm playing at that speed, there's always frames spent just kind of standing around or bumping into walls, because things are a little bit awkward to play when they're that fast. The few extra frames that accumulate in these times add up to be more game time, and because of that, it's not a direct analog with what it would be if you played it at one times game speed. So if my result says something like six hours, that doesn't mean you can just divide that time by four and then know what the real time was to complete the game. Game time also shares a con with real time, in that it skews results if I progress through the game with a lucky win. Someone like J-Rose has a great approach for this, because he'll sometimes reset if he thinks that he won because of too much luck. However, in the end, Pokemon includes some form of luck in it, it's just a part of the game, and it's hard to remove it entirely. Together, these two metrics give us a decent picture of how the Pokemon fares. However, both metrics miss out on the fact that lucky wins do occur, and results can be skewed because of this. For that reason alone, I treat these videos more as a competition instead of science. It's like a race, not always the strongest or fastest competitor wins. It's up to what happens on the day. People can crash, bad stuff can happen, and uh, there's going to be a lot of bad stuff in this video. <laughs> uh, I'm not always the most consistent when playing this game. Anyways, the next metric that I use to judge Pokemon is resets. The pros of this metric is that it gives an accurate representation of the number of times that I fail during an attempt. It's also a good metric to judge how frustrating a challenge was. One of its main cons is that it's entirely player error. Most of these challenges could honestly be done in a Nuzlocke style with the information that I obtained from making these videos. I've even thought of live streaming my attempts at Nuzlocke for each of the Pokemon that I've tried already to do a solo challenge with. 
but that information isn't available to you before you do the challenge, only after you attempt it once or twice. Because of that, resets can act as a metric that shows us how intuitive a Pokemon is on its initial playthrough. And then after that, it can show us how volatile the Pokemon is, or how much chance it relies on on successive attempts. The final metric that I use to judge my playthroughs is the level that the Pokemon arrives at the end of the game at. Overall, this is my least favorite metric for judging a Pokemon's performance with. Initially, I started using it because I needed three metrics, so I was using real time, game time, and level at completion because then I could break ties. However, in more recent times, I've figured out that level is not really the best way to judge a Pokemon. But it is a great metric to plan successive playthroughs with. So for example, if you finish the game at level 69, nice, and it felt very easy, you can now just adjust your training pattern on the next attempt and try to start the league at a lower level. But it would also have the chance and likelihood of decreasing real time spent playing. There's a lot of other metrics that I've thought of using in these videos to judge the Pokemon's performances on, and I won't be using them, but here's some of those ideas. I could judge the Pokemon based on how many vitamins it used throughout the playthrough, I could judge it on how many rare candies it used, or the number of TMs that it used throughout the playthrough. I also have the idea of creating something called a cumulative luck score, which would basically like aggregate all of the lucky events during a playthrough, and then spit out a score that would rank the Pokemon's playthrough based on how lucky it had to be to get those results. Honestly, I think that this would be really interesting and really fun to do, so if you have a background in math and you want to help out developing something like this, let me know. One day, fairly soon, I think I'll have a program that'll allow me to aggregate all of this data without having to spend like 3,000 hours putting it all together and watching the footage over and over again. So. Thanks so much to Greg Hart for making this program with me. Uh, we've put a lot of work into it and it's really helping out a lot to make these videos. But today I won't be using any of these metrics and we'll just stick with the regular four. Plus, those ones are pretty easy to understand. In summary, as a set of metrics, they just don't manage player error or luck particularly well. But in the end, it's a game, and there's a player playing the game. So in a lot of ways, this is me competing against myself with these three Pokemon. Remember, it's not science. Now I need to discuss some of the problems of doing this challenge in Pokemon Yellow. In trying to make this challenge as fair as possible, I realized that there's a problem with the rival's team. The Generation 1 Eeveelutions just don't match up symmetrically against the starters from Red and Blue. Charizard is weak to Vaporeon and Jolteon, Blastoise is weak to Jolteon, and Venusaur is weak to Flareon and Jolteon. That's because the Jolteon knows the move Pin Missile. So if each Pokemon wants to go as fast as possible, there's a clear Eeveelution that each one of them should face. Charizard and Blastoise should both face Flareon, and then Venusaur should face Vaporeon. But if we look at it a little bit more, Venusaur is also weak to Ice moves, and Vaporeon knows Ice moves in the final fight. Then you have to realize how the rival chooses his final stage evolution, and he does this based on the outcomes of the initial two rival battles in the game. This asymmetry can actually affect the results of these three Pokemon dramatically. If you want to face Jolteon for example, you need to defeat the optional rival, and this is going to delay your Brock split by more than a Pokemon who wants to say face Flareon, because Flareon only requires you to win the lab fight. Also if you want to face Vaporeon, you have to lose the fight in the lab. So why would you want to lose the first fight? That doesn't seem like a particularly good strategy, because you're one level behind the other Pokemon in that case. Additionally, adding even more complication to this scenario is the fact that he changes his Eevee's form as well as two of his other team slots depending on what he ends up choosing to evolve his Eevee into. In red and blue, this sort of asymmetry just doesn't exist. You can just replace whichever starter you want, and in that case you could give yourself a harder run by replacing the starter that makes the rival pick someone strong against you, or by forcing him to pick someone that's weak to you, you can have an easier time. I thought about how to manage the yellow rival for a long time before making this video. What's the best approach? Everyone faces a specific evolution so that Pokemon is forced to take the same track to Brock, or allow each Pokemon to make choices to optimize their rooting. In the end, I chose the option that was worst for my sanity, and also for me producing this video and getting it out in time. Uh, so I chose to face every single rival team, and by that I mean I did four playthroughs of Pokemon Yellow with each one of these Pokemon. So I did an initial playthrough, and then I did a follow-up playthrough against each one of the evolutions. So in this way, I think we have enough data at the end of this whole process to hopefully say which path we think is best for each Pokemon, and also which Pokemon is overall strongest in yellow. However, I still had to pick which evolution I wanted his final form to take in the first initial playthrough. And here's what I settled on. Jolteon's electric attacks do 2 times damage to Blastoise and Charizard. Jolteon's pin missile on the other hand, which it knows in the champion fight, does 4 times damage to Venusaur. In generation 1, bug moves are super effective against both grass and poison types, so that's why this does 4 times damage. This type of effectiveness was changed in generation 2, so you might not be familiar with this gen 1 quirk. So I figured that Jolteon was sort of hard mode for all of these starters, so I decided to make each one of them play against Jolteon for the first playthrough. Now with all that preamble out of the way, <laughs> it's like, 
How is this video this long already? Anyways, now with all that out of the way, let's do a comparison of these Pokemon. Today I'll be starting with each of these Pokemon's first stages and evolving them throughout the playthrough. After all, if you receive them as a starter, this is how it would go. In some versus videos, it makes most sense to start with the final form, like with the trade evolutions, but today it makes sense to start with the initial form. The Venusaur line has excellent stats for Generation 1. Balanced HP, attack, defense, and speed, with outstanding special. In these games, Special acts both offensively and defensively, so Venusaur can take hits as well as dish them out. Also, base 80 speed is more than enough to outspeed nearly every intimidating opponent once you've earned some stat experience. In Generation 1 and 2, EVs don't exist. In their place is a system called Stat Experience. It differs from EVs because you can train all your stats simultaneously until they max out. All the AI Pokémon have zero stat experience in all their stats, giving the player's Pokémon a significant advantage that only increases as the game progresses. The Venusaur line's only downside is that its move pool is incredibly limited. Razor Leaf is great because it gets the same type attack bonus and is a high critical hit ratio move, but aside from it, Venusaur is seriously lacking some type coverage. There are only grass and normal moves to choose from. Do note that this strange flower dinosaur or frog thing learns Sleep Powder, Body Slam, and Sword Stance though. I uh, bet you can already guess what my final moveset's gonna be. I think the greatest challenge for Venusaur is going to be Agatha because her ghosts are part poison type and I don't really have a good move against them. I'm just going to have to brute force them down with grass moves I guess. The Charizard line doesn't have great stats in Generation 1. It has fairly balanced HP, attack, defense, and special with outstanding speed. I think the Fire Lizard is going to be held back by the fact that its special and attack stats aren't comparable to Venusaur's 100 special. However, the fan favorite makes up for its stat deficits with a diverse move pool. Flamethrower, Sword Stance, Body Slam, Submission, Earthquake, Dig, and Fly. That's really great coverage. Finally, Blastoise has perhaps the worst stat distribution for a solo playthrough of the three Pokemon. Balanced HP, attack, special, and speed, with outstanding defense. Like, ugh. However, its water typing is just better in the late game, especially more so than the grass and fire typings. Its move pool is similarly diverse to Charizard's. It has access to Surf, Ice Beam, Submission, Earthquake, and Dig. So here's the community poll that I made last week to see what all of you think is going to happen. And most people think that Venusaur is going to come out ahead. My personal prediction is that Blastoise is going to win with Venusaur taking close second place. I think that the water typing along with access to more diverse moves than Venusaur is going to give the turtle its edge. Fire types haven't performed well in Kanto so far in my challenges, so I uh, really don't expect Charizard to be the exception. So let's find out. Were you right or was I right? Or did I not see it coming and is Charizard actually going to be the dark horse of this playthrough? Let's see. Uh, before I start, I actually want to make a couple notes. I know this is taking forever, <laughs> but I started filming this video in September, so some of my overlays and stuff looks less polished than it has been recently, and also I recently started using rare candies in the middle of my playthroughs, as they can really speed up a Pokemon's playthrough time. When I started making this video, I was banning rare candies for versus videos, so I completed this footage with that rule in place. So if you wonder why I don't just use rare candies to speed things up, it's because I started filming a while ago and I wanted to keep things consistent. And now, let's actually get into these playthroughs. Since I'm forcing all the Pokémon to face Jolteon, I've got to defeat the rival in both the lab and the optional rival fight west of Viridian City. For Bulbasaur, this is going to be the first significant hurdle. The problem with his team is the initial Spearow. It knows Peck. I want to level up enough that I'm not going to incur any resets during this fight. That would be pretty embarrassing after all. Also, immediately following this rival fight, I'll have to take on Brock, so I need a good option against him. To speed that fight up, I really want to know Vine Whip, so I level up to level 13 before attempting. The rival opens with Spearow and I choose Vine Whip. I was hoping that my higher special stat would allow it to do more damage than Tackle, because this Spearow loves to use Growl. However, the two moves are doing about the same amount of damage, and after missing my second Tackle, Spearow lands a massive peck, taking Bulbasaur all the way down to orange health. My next Tackle connects and the bird faints, leading to Eevee. I choose Vine Whip and it does around one third damage. Eevee lowers my defense with Tail Whip, my second Vine Whip takes it into red health, and then Eevee lands a Tackle, which does surprisingly little damage. With that out of the way, I head to Brock as fast as possible, skipping the heal in Pewter City and the battle against the Lightyear's junior trainer. Brock opens with Geodude, and a 4 times effective Vine Whip knocks it out in a single hit. Onyx is next, and it's the exact same story. Bulbasaur clocks in with a time of 11 minutes and 1 second. Up next is Charmander. By the way, I'm going in this order right now at the beginning of the video because it's the order of the Pokedex. The order that I present this footage in in the video has nothing to do with the order I played these challenges in. I'm always rearranging the footage in post for dramatic purposes of course. Gotta keep things entertaining. 
Charmander has a distinct advantage over Bulbasaur for the optional rival fight. It learns Ember at level 9, whereas Bulbasaur learns Vine Whip at level 13, so I won't need to level up as much in preparation for this fight. With Ember, I speed past the Spearow and take the Eevee down with only minor damage in the process. This is where Charmander gets its second advantage. All of the Bug-type Pokémon in Viridian Forest are weak to fire moves, giving this little fiery cutie an excellent place to train. You'd think that I'd need to spend a significant amount of time training here because Brock is a Rock-type trainer, but I actually only fight the optional Bug Catchers and then move on to Brock without any training in the wild. While his Pokémon are Rock Ground types that have a single resistance to fire moves, the fact that they have just abysmal special stats makes Ember a viable option against all of them. It's doing roughly one quarter damage to the Geodude, and I knock it out while I'm still in green health. Onyx is next and it takes less damage. Damage. However, Brock just uses Screech, misses a bind, uses another Screech, and then finally uses Tackle, taking me down to 15 hit points. But it's too little too late. Charmander finishes off the Rock Snake and earns a time of 6 minutes and 8 seconds. That's a lot better than Bulbasaur. Do you see how forcing Bulbasaur to do the optional rival fight to face Jolteon really impaired its time in this playthrough? So, yeah, I'm interested to explore other options with Bulbasaur, because this is clearly not the best one for it. It's worth noting at this point as I switch to Squirtle that I played the start of the game with each of these Pokemon as a warm-up before doing this playthrough. In both of those warm-up playthroughs, Bulbasaur and Charmander actually lost to the rival in the lab. Of all three of the starters, Squirtle is the best suited for this fight because of its higher defense stat. I think this made me a little bit overconfident though while I was training and I almost got knocked out by a Rattata. I'm so lucky that I survived that with one hit point. At level 9, I feel ready for the second rival fight because Squirtle has learned Bubble. Spiro outspeeds with Peck and does 6 damage, and Bubble does almost no damage in return. Okay, so I think uh, Tackle is the better choice. Bubble is really bad. However, Spiro moves first and uses Growl, ruining my attack stat. So this is really not good. It takes me a while to knock the bird out, and in the process, it lowers my defense and my attack stat further. Little Squirtle is really not in a good position once Eevee comes out. I make some silly choices against the Eevee trying to lower its defense, but I just decide that Bubble has to be the best choice because it's a special move. However, the sand attacks stack up and eventually Eevee knocks me out. That's the first reset of the entire video. I really didn't think that it was going to be in a Squirtle playthrough. I was like sure that it was going to be Charmander at Misty or something like that. I immediately face the rival again, and this time I know that I'll get better luck. Instead of playing the gambling game with Tackle, I decide to just spam Bubble the entire time. He can't lower my special after all. By doing this, I'm able to knock out both of his Pokémon and take the victory. I think I should have leveled up a little bit more to make this fight consistent though. Brock opens with Geodude, and today I've got 4 times damage with Bubble. Despite it being a 20 power move, it takes care of the Geodude in a single hit. Onyx is next. It outspeeds my turtle, does almost nothing with Tackle, and then Bubble doesn't knock it out. So. That's a nuisance. Brock's wasting my time as usual. Squirtle clocks in with a time of 7 minutes and 23 seconds. Of all three of the starters, I didn't think Squirtle would emerge in the middle of the pack with a single reset after Brock. Maybe it can gain back some of its lost time on the next leg of the race. To help me do this, I get access to Water Gun on the next route, and then it evolves into War Turtle. In Mount Moon, I skip the rare candy because I've banned them from these playthroughs, just remember that, and then I make a major mistake. I forget to pick up the TM for Mega Punch. Ah, at least I remember to grab the Dome Fossil. The rival on Nugget Bridge is next. The strategy here is simple. Spam Water Gun, like I did in my friend's basement when I was a kid. <laughs> Believe me, his parents were not impressed. The rival isn't either though, because I beat him with relative ease. Nugget Bridge provides some good experience and accumulates with a battle against the Oddish Lass. If you've been watching my content for a while, you'll know that she's pretty annoying when you have a Water-type Pokémon. This is the first reason I should have picked up Mega Punch. Tackle is just dealing under half damage. Against the first Oddish, I missed two times, allowing the little Radish thing to take War Turtle all the way down to 23 hit points. This is not going well. Pidgey's next, and Water Gun makes quick work of it. Okay, that's good. Please, I just need to defeat the next Oddish. Tackle comes through and gets the job done in three turns. That was way closer and slower than it needed to be though, and unfortunately for my Squirtle playthrough, the lack of Mega Punch is really going to slow me down again. Misty would have been just so easy with it, but without it I'd have to rely on Tackle to knock her Pokemon out. Because of her love for Harden and Next Defend, and the fact that she has good AI, forcing her to use only normal moves against me, I'm not looking forward to the slog of a fight that that would be. Instead, I'll head south to Vermilion first and get Body Slam before taking her on. On the way, I defeat the Rocket and get the TM for Dig. It's incredible that War Turtle can learn this, and it's going to be extremely relevant soon. On the SSN, I pick up Rest and Body Slam and then face the third rival. If the Pokémon you're doing a challenge with can learn Dig or Body Slam, then this fight's going to be really easy, so I probably won't mention it for the remainder of the video because all the starters can learn at least one of these moves. The only thing that makes this fight hard is if you can't learn those moves and your learn set has become slightly stale when you arrive here. 
With him out of the way, I use Dig in Diglett's cave to save walk time between Vermilion and Cerulean, and then I go head-to-head -head with Misty. She opens with Staryu, and as I mentioned before, she has good AI. So let me explain that to you. Essentially, this is an AI modification that makes the trainer prioritize moves that are a type that is super effective against the opponent's Pokémon, and it also prevents the trainer from using moves that are not very effective. There are some complicated priorities here if your Pokémon's a dual type, but War Turtle isn't, so Misty just knows that water moves are not very effective against water Pokémon, so she's only going to have Tackle as a way to deal damage to me. That lets War Turtle take the easy victory over her. She gives me the TM for Bubble Beam, and I learn it right away. Later on, my go-to is going to be Surf, so there's no reason not to upgrade right now. Next is Surge. He opens with Raichu, and for him, I'm very lucky that Wartortle learns Dig. Surge uses X-Speed on the first turn, Wartortle burrows underground, and hits the mouse for nearly enough damage. Surge doesn't have good AI in yellow though, so he uses Mega Kick next turn and I finish the electric mouse off. Time to make use of Dig again to get back to Cerulean. It's such a great field move for these playthroughs. I'm lucky that my HM Mule Charmander learns it, so even if my challenge Pokemon doesn't have it, I still get access to it in every yellow playthrough I do. The wrapping lasts is next, and you might think that she's going to drop a sick mixtape, but that's just not the type of wrapping I'm talking about. Instead, she loves to paralyze your Pokemon and then trap them in endless wraps with her Bellsprout until you feel truly hopeless. Luckily, Body Slam completely wrecks her today. Normally, she's the first of what is a gauntlet of difficult mandatory trainers in this section of the game, but Wartortle is capable of defeating all of them with ease, even the self-destructing hiker. Now, normally in this segment of my Versus videos, I narrate until the Pokemon defeats Erika, but today I'm going to be skipping her until much later with this playthrough. Even with Ice Beam from Celadon, I don't want to try it. It's just going to be far safer to prioritize other things first. Before I explain where Wartortle's headed next, let's catch up with the other two Pokemon. On the route after Brock, Charmander also evolves into its second stage, Charmeleon. And then in Mount Moon, I make the same mistake and forget Mega Punch again. <sighs> Yikes. So I want to just briefly mention why I make so many mistakes like this in my playthroughs. Uh, the first reason is ADHD. Uh, I have serious issues with memory, and so often facts or information will just like slip out of my mind at the least opportune moments. Like, go pick up Mega Punch. <laughs> I'm not going to remember that. Another reason these sort of mistakes occur is that I'm playing the game on four times game speed, and I'm doing it as a speed run. Every second feels so important, so I make decisions in the blink of an eye. I'm just trying not to waste time. At the second rival fight, Charmeleon isn't in as good of a position as Wartortle was. Water Gun is just better against this fight because it's super effective against the Sand Shrew. However, Ember's still good enough for my Flame Lizard to achieve victory on the first fight. I need to skip Misty, obviously, and obtain Body Slam first with Charmeleon. Her good AI would obviously make quick work of my Fire type, so I have to head to the SSN first. I dig back and then I face her at level 27. Body Slam does enough to knock Staryu out in a single hit. Her ace, Starby, is last. Body Slam does just under half damage, and then it chooses Bubble Beam, which does so much damage, taking Charmeleon down from full health into the red. Okay, so that was so bad because it was a critical hit. It also lowers my speed then. Okay, come on, like, ugh. Next turn, Misty uses an X-Defend, and I don't think that I'm going to have enough damage to knock it out. However, I score a lucky critical hit and Starmie faints. Okay, that was good. Surge is next. His Raichu starts the fight off by receiving an X-Speed. Ah, always excellent Surge, you just make the best choices. Charmeleon digs and takes the Electric Mouse into red health. Raichu attempts Mega Kick, misses, and my Body Slam knocks it out. That's another easy Surge fight for the books. As I'm heading through Rock Tunnel, I'm starting to get worried about the self-destructing hiker. So let me explain who he is. He's a hiker that's mandatory at the end of the tunnel, and he has three Pokemon on his team. Two Geodudes and one Graveler. And all of them know self-destruct. This can be really hard to get past in a solo playthrough, especially if you don't have a move that's super effective against rock ground types. And Charmeleon doesn't really have a good option against him. Well, that's what I was thinking, but it does actually have a good option against him. Um, I think you're gonna see it, so yeah. Ah, uh, I didn't see it when I was doing the playthrough. Whoops. All I remembered is that Geodude has Trash Special, so why not just use Ember against it? That's the strategy I used against Brock anyways. So while I use this less than optimal strategy, what's the actual best strategy here for Charmeleon? Well, Dig is super effective, and when you're underground, the Geodude can actually blow up and deal no damage to you. Making this even better from a speedrunning perspective is that it also saves time, because you stay underground, and then the next Pokémon comes out, and then you knock it out with Dig. Uh, finally I realized the error of my ways at Graveler, I select Dig, and I knock it out. At least I didn't have to pay for that mistake with a reset. In this next portion of the game, the run is going to change forever for Charmeleon. 
I take care of Pokemon Tower with ease, after that I do my regular training in Sylph. If I was using rare candies in these playthroughs, this is a section of the game that I could cut a lot of time out of. However, if you aren't using rare candies, training here is typically key because the level curve really jumps up at Koga and Sabrina. During the training, just before evolution, I pick up the TM for Swords Dance, and this is perhaps the best move that Charizard can learn. The power of stat boosting moves in Generation 1 really can't be understated, and I'm going to explain why very soon. With Sword Stance on my moveset, I feel prepared to take on the Sylph rival. He opens with Sand Slash, and I immediately begin to set up. He uses Poison Sting, and that lets me have two turns of fun dancing. However, Slash does a lot of damage to me on the second turn, so I decide to take him down. In retrospect, it would have been safer to set up on the following Ninetales. I pay for this mistake when Sand Slash uses Sand Attack on me and lowers my accuracy. You may not know this, but in Generation 1, having your accuracy lowered by one stage cuts it by 33%. Starting in Pokemon Stadium in Generation 1, this was updated so that it's only lowered by 25%. No wonder I hate sand attacks so much in these games. Because of these different stages, it actually means that your accuracy can be lowered all the way down till it's 25%, but this really feels like 1% accuracy. In modern games, the lowest possible accuracy is roughly 33%. Unfortunately today, I miss against Cloyster and it knocks me out. Instead of bashing my head against this rival, I decided to take on Erica first, because after all, both of Charizard's typings are strong against her Pokemon. As expected, she's really easy and I get a time of 37 minutes and 55 seconds. Bulbasaur evolves on the route after Brock, just like the other two starters. They all evolve at level 16, so none of them have an advantage here. In Mount Moon, I spent a little extra time knocking out some random Geodude that showed up, and I did this for experience. I played this playthrough in September, and I hadn't realized that I should just skip all of this because I can earn this experience much faster later on. Bulbasaur doesn't need additional levels now anyways. I grab the Dome Fossil, and believe me, Bulbasaur is going to be praying to this for the majority of this video. And then I take on the rival on Nugget Bridge. I was most worried about his Spearow because it knows Peck. However, he doesn't have good AI in this fight, so he just randomly uses moves, and he selects Fury Attack, which is much better than spamming Peck. The bird takes me down to orange health before it faints. Santru is a one hit with a super effective Vine Whip, and Rattata takes surprisingly two hits. I really did think its low special stat would allow me to one hit it. Eevee's last. I get a critical hit turn 1, and it misses Sand Attack. Okay, that's good. It survives my Vine Whip, and then finally blows dust in my face, causing Ivysaur to miss. But on the next turn, I connect and take the victory. On Nugget Bridge, I have a realization. Regular trainer battles feel so much slower with Ivysaur than they did with Charmeleon. A lot of these trainers have Bug, Poison, and Flying types on their teams, and that really takes away from my Grass type's offensive potential, especially when my best stat is my special. Charmeleon, on the other hand, didn't have this problem because fire moves are super effective against bugs and neutral for both the poison and flying types. While Charmeleon may struggle against the first two gyms, where Ivysaur does not, this discrepancy is made up by these regular trainer battles, which are just a slog with this grass type frog. I, uh, I know it's not a frog, but uh, if I say it is, you'll comment down below about how wrong I am, right? I finish Misty off and I head south to Vermilion in the intended order. On the SSN, Ivysaur gets access to Body Slam. This is going to be my go-to physical move for the rest of the playthrough. Very soon I'll add Razor Leaf, and this then will be my go-to special move. Remember, in Generation 1, it's pre-physical special split, so all normal moves are physical and all grass moves are special. An easy way to remember which type is which is that all the special types are the types of the evolutions that have been introduced to date, plus Dragon type. Everything else is physical. Yes, including Ghost. I uh, always forget that one. Surge opens with Raichu, and whoops, <laughs> I forgot to heal before this fight. I wish I could say this is because I was trying to optimize my playthrough time and I didn't want to spend the extra seconds using a potion, but it wasn't. The Electric Mouse uses Mega Punch and takes me down to just over one third health. I retaliate with Body Slam and it looks like it's going to be a three hit, unless I get a lucky critical hit. Raichu uses Mega Kick, misses, and my next Body Slam connects and gets a critical hit. Okay, nice, I did it. So I got the luck that I needed. I'm moving on. During Rock Tunnel, Ivysaur learns Razor Leaf, and I need to explain how critical hits work in Generation 1. In modern Pokemon games, critical hits occur roughly with a probability of 1 in every 24 hits. That's a 4.17 chance to crit. This used to be 1 in every 16 hits, or a 6.25%, and that was the case between Generations 2 and 6. This was actually updated most recently in Generation 7. But in Generation 1, things are wonky. The probability of scoring a critical hit is calculated based on the Pokemon's base speed. We can determine the critical hit probability by dividing the Pokemon's base speed by 5.12, which gives Ivysaur a roughly 12% chance to land a critical hit. 
Some moves, however, have a boosted critical hit rate. These moves are Karate Chop Slash, Razor Leaf, and Crab Hammer. In the case a Pokemon is using one of these moves, we need to divide its base speed by 0.64, giving Ivysaur a 93.75% chance to crit when using Razor Leaf. Okay, so you might realize that Ivysaur's speed is not particularly fast, so like what happens if the speed goes up? Well, you'll get a number that's more than 100, and that means the Pokemon is basically guaranteed to get a critical hit. Well, it's guaranteed to get a critical hit in that it can get a critical hit 99.61% of the time. For programming reasons, the maximum threshold for obtaining a critical hit in Generation 1 is 255 out of 256. So in the same way you could miss in Generation 1, you could also fail to get a critical hit in Generation 1. However, I'll refer to this as guaranteed critical hits from now on. Yeah, yeah, I'll point out if one fails specifically because of this threshold. The next portion of the game is straightforward for Ivysaur, and it's all going to culminate with me obtaining Sword Stance. I mentioned before that I don't want to understate how powerful stat altering moves are in Generation 1, so here's the full explanation as to why. In Generation 1 there's a glitch commonly referred to as the Badge Boost glitch, where stats are incorrectly recalculated during battle. Here's how it works. Certain badges give passive boosts to your Pokemon's stats. This is actually the case in Generation 1, 2, and 3. Badge boosts were removed in Generation 4. More specifically, the Boulder Badge raises your attack stat, the Thunder Badge raises your defense, not sure why, the Soul Badge raises your speed, and the Volcano Badge raises your special. There is no badge that raises your HP stat, of course. The buff received from each of these is a 12.5% increase to that particular stat, and this is calculated during battle, so it won't appear on your Pokemon's stat summary page. All of this is intended design. So here's how the glitch works. Whenever your Pokemon's stats are modified in battle, the game erroneously recalculates the badge boosts, applying them again, on top of other changes, and other badge boosts. This can be triggered in three different ways. When you use a stat altering move on your Pokemon, when the AI uses a stat altering move that targets your Pokemon, or if you use an item that raises your stats. The game does in fact recalculate the intended stat correctly. It's just the other stats that get the additional 12.5% boost if you have the badge that provides that boost already. So in this circumstance with Sword Stance, the first use will double Venusaur's attack, however Venusaur will also receive a 12.5% boost in its defense stat because I've obtained the Thunder Badge. I haven't got the Soul or Volcano Badges yet, so I'll need to defeat Koga and Blaine in order to get all of my stats boosted while using Sword Stance. So I think that you can tell that this is extremely broken. Uh, I don't ban this though in my Generation 1 playthroughs because quite frankly, it's like nearly impossible to avoid this. If it was a rule that I couldn't use the badge boost glitch, then if I ever got hit by like a leer from the opponent, I would have to reset. That also means that I wouldn't be able to raise any of my stats with any stat altering moves, and that just seems like it isn't very fun. Obviously, you can play the game where you only boost stats that you believe are relevant and don't intentionally trigger the badge boost glitch, and today I'm not going to hold myself to that standard. But we won't be seeing things like Withdraw from Blastoise in order to boost its special stat, for instance. It's worth noting that I thought that Leech Seed might be helpful later on, so I decided to skip teaching Swords Dance right away, and then I fought the rival. Oh dear, never underestimate Swords Dance in Generation 1. Past me is clearly making a mistake here. He opens with Sand Slash, and Razor Leaf misses. Ugh, 95% accuracy hurts me. I take minimal damage from Poison Sting and finish Sand Slash off with my leaves next turn. Ninetales is next. I use Body Slam and it isn't doing very much damage. So here, Sword Stance would be really helpful because I could set up on the Sand Slash. If I maxed out my attack stat, I would have one hit the Fiery Fairy Fox. I managed to get through the Jolteon and here I'm going to remind you about another piece of Generation 1 strangeness. Bug type moves are super effective against both Grass and Poison types, making Pin Missile deal 4 times damage to Venusaur, and that causes me to faint. Instead, I decide to head over to Erica first instead of trying this fight again with Sword Stance. That probably would have been the most efficient thing to do, but hindsight's 2020. The Grass Gym, however, is a sure bet. I defeat her with ease and I earn a time of 41 minutes and 21 seconds. Let's check in with Blastoise before we compare all the Pokemon's times so far. Instead of taking on Erica, I finish off Pokemon Tower and then immediately head south to Fuchsia City. Obtaining Surf as fast as possible can sometimes be a strong strategy when using a Water-type Pokemon. After all, Surf is a 95 base power move in Generation 1. It was actually changed to 90 base power in Generation 6, by the way. Because Blastoise is a Water-type Pokemon, Surf gets the same type attack bonus, which is a 1.5 times modifier, leaving Surf with roughly 142.5 power against neutral targets. To be technically accurate, it's actually the damage that's multiplied, not the move's base power, but this is a decent shorthand to understand the effect of stab on the moves you use. Having Surf on my side allows me to speed up my training in Sylph. 
While Blastoise doesn't learn Sword Stance, it does learn Earthquake, so I grab that TM here. In Generation 1 though, Dig has 100 base power as well, so Earthquake only offers less frames in battle while Dig allows me to escape from places like Sylph, Pokemon Mansion, Blaine's Gym, and Sabrina's Gym. In retrospect, to get the best possible time, I might start buying escape ropes for these locations and removing Dig in favor of Earthquake to save frames in battle. That's, I think, the best of both worlds. The Sylph Rival's first two Pokemon are easy for Blastoise to finish off with its water cannons. Cloyster's next, and there isn't a great option for it. I take it out over a few turns and move on to Kadabra, and it faints to a single body slam. Jolteon is last. The Punk Rock Doggo only knows Thundershock, so I survive and knock it out with a single dig. Blastoise is the only Pokemon to proceed past the rival on its first attempt. Granted, I was at a higher level than the other two when I first attempted it. I steamroll Giovanni next, do some training in the Fighting Dojo to raise my level even more, and then I go head to head with Koga, who is going to be my pick for my fourth gym leader with the Water Turtle. He opens with Venonat, Surf connects and takes the bug out in a single hit. Okay. That's nice and comforting to know that the turtle's outspeeding the bugs. I just need this to continue. The third Venonat, however, survives and uses Sleep Powder, but it misses and I knock it out. Venomoth is last. This electric grass type is really scary for Blastoise, and Surf just isn't doing very much damage. In the end, I take it down and earn a time of 48 minutes and 26 seconds. Now, let's review the results so far. Charizard got an early lead in the Brock split because it was able to defeat the optional rival without any issues. Ah, uh, sorry Squirtle, you got really unlucky there. Bulbasaur obviously struggled because it needed to obtain a high enough level to defeat the Spearow on his team, so it was kind of forced into a bad situation. Unsurprisingly, in the next section of the game, Charizard started to lose its lead, especially in the Misty split, despite its ability to knock out trainers Pokemon with ease. Aiding Venusaur's time is its ability not to head south to Vermilion before taking on the water type leader Misty. However, after Surge you can see that Venusaur's pace is still significantly slower than the other two. The common bug, flying, and poison types really slow it down in regular trainer battles. After the fourth gym, which I have labeled as Gym 4 intentionally, because not all three of these Pokemon faced Erika, Charizard has retained its lead. Venusaur's closed the gap slightly, while Blastoise has fallen behind, largely because of my choice to skip Erika and over-prepare for Koga. I'm a bit surprised, because I thought Brock and Misty would delay Charizard more than this, but access to Body Slam for Misty, Dig for Surge, and Fire Typing for Erika really propels the Lizard into the lead. Can it maintain it though? Let's find out. Charizard heads to the Safari Zone next, where it gets some vitamins. By this point I've learned Slash, a high critical hit ratio move, and I should have contemplated if Ember or Slash would have been better against Koga. Ember is a 40 power move, 60 power with stab, and 120 power after super effective damage. Slash on the other hand is 70 base power and it gets critical hit modifier, which is based on the Pokemon's level in generation 1. So Charizard gets a 1.89 multiplier at level 42 whenever it lands a critical hit. If we do the approximation and apply this to base power, it ends up with just over 132 power. However, I didn't think it through in the moment and I use Ember instead. After all, it can cause a burn. It's enough to get the job done against the Grass Flying Behemoth and I'm moving on. Okay, so it's time to try the Sylph Rival again. You'll notice that I don't have Sword Stance here, that's because I reset before I learned it. I thought that with the higher level I'd be able to manage him without it, but it turns out that this isn't the case and Cloyster finishes me off with Clamp. Flamethrower is just around the corner though and it's going to make everything easier, so I train up and learn it in the place of Ember. With it on my side I'm able to take care of the Rival. While writing this script, I was starting to wonder if Sword Stance, Body Slam, Slash, and Dig would have been a better move set, and that would have allowed me to progress perhaps at a lower level. Giving up Dig or Body Slam would obviously be a really bad choice, and while playing this challenge, I wasn't thinking about deleting my only fire move. I wanted to hold on to Slash as well, so that's why I got backed into this move set. In Generation 1, I feel like I've said that like a hundred times in this video. Anyways, <laughs> in Generation 1, critical hits ignore all the stat changes, even the beneficial ones from Sword Stance, so Slash is a faster way of knocking out Pokemon without the need for setup. That's why I wanted to keep it, but in the end it doesn't synergize well with Sword Stance, so you don't want to keep it when both of those moves are on your moveset. In most playthroughs I fight Blaine next because I want the special boost his badge confers for its defensive properties against Sabrina. Unsurprisingly, Charizard doesn't have a problem with this fight. Next is Sabrina, and Slash is very helpful here. She loves to use X-Defend or Reflect with Alakazam, and I can bypass those potential stat boosts. Another easy badge for the Not Dragon Lizard. It's time for Giovanni. If you haven't watched many of my challenge videos, you'll probably think that he's really easy. Because in Red and Blue, yeah, he's a huge pushover. But in Pokemon Yellow, he got a really big upgrade. Four of his five Pokemon now know Earthquake, but that isn't relevant for Charizard. Its wings help out a lot here. 
Instead, the final Rhydon knows Rock Slide, and it's 5 levels higher than it is in red and blue. Rock moves do 4 times damage because they're both super effective against fire and flying types. So Charizard really doesn't want to get hit by rocks, and in the first battle this is clearly on display. Dig just doesn't knock out the Rhydon despite doing super effective damage, and then the Rhino crushes Charizard with rocks. I tried one more time, but Rhydon still gets me. I'll train up a couple more levels and avoid wasting time. Remember, in these challenges, training is usually faster than continuously attempting and hoping for luck, unless the only metric you're concerned with is game time. I buy some vitamins with Charizard once my training is complete, and then I attempt again at level 55. This time against Rhydon, I use Flamethrower to see if this not very effective special move will do more damage than the super effective physical dig. However, it's doing less, but only by a small margin. Rhydon really doesn't have good special. Rock Slide connects, and from nearly full hit points, Charizard faints. That wasn't even a critical hit. I try Submission in the place of Body Slam for the next fight, and it turns out this isn't a good choice. Like, obviously, it removes the ability to use Body Slam and Swords Dance together, but it also just sucks against Rhydon. Submission is the worst move in the game. I hate it. In the next fight, I try Reflect again in the place of Body Slam, and I don't even get to see how this plays out against Rock Slide because Giovanni uses a guard spec, and with that I'm proceeding. However, the mistake of removing Body Slam I think is going to be something that I look back on with disdain. Only time will tell. The final rival that follows is simple to defeat, and Charizard clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 12 minutes, and 16 seconds before the league. For a fully evolved Pokémon, this really honestly isn't a good time. Perhaps Venusaur can do a better job? Because the Sylph rival was a challenge, I want to gain more levels before re-attempting him. To do so, I train on Cycling Road. After that's finished, I take on Koga. Venonat is first, and my best choice against it is Body Slam. I get a critical hit, and I almost knock it out. However, that means that the following Venonat is going to survive at least two hits. That gives it time to hit me with super effective Psychic. The third Venonat faints, and Venomoth comes out. Now I'm feeling insecure because my PP is too low. Without it, I won't be able to continue body slamming, and because of that, the fight gets really close, and Koga ends up taking the victory. Ah, <sighs> PP problems. A uh, typical Scott's Thoughts experience. I train in Sylph and pick up Swords Dance. This training allows Venusaur to learn growth, which you'd think would be amazing, but honestly, Razor Leaf getting critical hits negates its effects. Since I'm a higher level now, and I'm here in Sylph, I'll try the rival again. Razor Leaf knocks out Sandslash in a single hit. Ninetales takes two turns of Body Slam and deals good damage with a critical hit Ember along the way. Razor Leaf takes care of Cloyster, Body Slam for Kadabra, and Jolteon is last. It uses Pin Missile, hits only two times, and then Body Slam connects. But it isn't enough. Then Pin Missile gets a critical hit, and in Generation 1, ah, yeah, another Generation 1 quirk, each successive hit does the same amount of damage as the initial hit. One, two, okay, only two hits. Venusaur survives on red health and knocks Jolteon out. I make my way back to Koga and face him again at my higher level. However, when I was playing this playthrough, I still hadn't figured out Swords Dance and Body Slam. Like, I was really trying to keep growth and leech seed for as long as possible. Uh, in retrospect, while watching this footage, it just seems like such an obvious mistake. I know now how it feels for all of you to watch my videos. You're just like, please use Quick Attack on Misty's Star Me when it was at low health, and I'm just like, yeah, but I forgot. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Venomoth is last. I use Body Slam, get a critical hit, and paralyze the moth, allowing me to take it out. So with that, I've earned the Soul Badge. Up next are Blaine and Sabrina, who both have a type advantage over Venusaur. I decide to face Sabrina first, and for this fight, I finally teach Venusaur Sword Stance. Abra's first, and it's annoying because it knows Flash. However, first turn, Sabrina uses an X Defend, allowing me to set up for two turns with Sword Stance before the first accuracy drop occurs. I use Body Slam to hopefully prevent more, and Abra faints in a single hit. Kadabra's next. Body Slam connects and knocks it out. Alakazam is last, Venusaur focuses, Body Slams, and the Psychic Fox faints. I think this strategy was slightly risky, I should have probably just swept with one sword stance after the initial Abra got X Defend. Either way, Blaine's next. He opens with Ninetales, and I want to set up against the Rapidash, because it only has Fire Spin. Because of that I immediately start with Body Slam, and I cause Paralysis right away. This status condition gives me a little bit of wiggle room, so I decide to set up with Sword Stance before knocking Ninetales out. Note, Blaine doesn't have good AI in yellow, so he just randomly selects moves. Because I have one turn of setup, I attack Rapidash right away, and it doesn't quite get the job done, but it does paralyze. I think the safer play would be to set up next, but I knock it out. Here you can see I'm making split second decisions because I can feel the pressure of time. Blaine's ace Arcanine is last. My first hit is a critical hit invalidating my setup. That sucks. Arcanine uses Reflect, and then my second body slam is also a crit, which ends the fight. It didn't seem like that was within the realm of possible roles I could get, but oh well, 
I won't argue with it. In stark contrast to Charizard's run, Giovanni is incredibly easy. Razor Leaf takes care of basically all of his Pokemon. The Nidos are a poison type, so they take neutral damage from it, but they don't know any moves I'm truly scared of. Plus, Giovanni has good AI, so it checks this list of combinations to determine which super effective moves it should use against the opponent. Funny thing is, it makes decisions based on the lower entry on the list. In this case, ground moves are resisted by grass types, so don't use Earthquake, even though it would do neutral damage and get stab. The final rival's a breeze. I just spam Body Slam and win. Without setup. What I'm starting to realize is that Venusaur can likely do all of this at a lower level and leverage Sword Stance much more than it currently is. During this fight though I level up and it comes with Sleep Powder. So this is one advantage of being overleveled. I get this incredible move for the entire league. Ah, uh, so here we go again. In Generation 1, Sleep is broken because the turn you wake up you don't actually attack. Sword Stance plus Sleep Powder is going to be a brutal combo for my opponents to face. I uh, really don't envy them. Venusaur clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 8 minutes, and 9 seconds before the league. Last is Blastoise, and the turtle isn't going particularly fast yet, but things are about to get put into high gear. I pick up Blizzard in the mansion and then walk circles around Blaine with Surf. This is obviously an easy fight. Sabrina's next. I don't have a setup move for her, so I need to just rely on Body Slam. It KOs the Avra, but the Cadaver survives with a sliver of health. But it gets an X Defend, and I knock it out without taking any damage. Alakazam moves first, sets up Reflect, and minimizes damage from Body Slam, taking only one third damage. Because Sabrina could use an X Defend on it, I start using Surf, which does more damage than Body Slam. After Alakazam uses Recover, it takes three turns for me to knock it out and earn the Marsh Badge. I train up a bit in the last gym so that I'm at an appropriate level to take the League on. Then I face Giovanni, and like with the Venusaur fight, it's going to be really easy. I Surf my way to a quick victory. Before facing my final rival, I upgrade my moveset, replacing Dig with Earthquake. There is no need for escape rope functionality anymore. This rival fight should be fairly easy until his ace. Surf for Sand Slash, Ice Beam for his Execute, Surf for Ninetales, ah, Surf for Cloister I guess? Like, it doesn't have the best special stat, Body Slam for Kadabra, and that leads to Jolteon. It moves first and uses Thunder Wave. In this situation, I just need to get off an Earthquake. I do, and Jolteon faints. Blastoise arrives at the league with a time of 1 hour, 1 minute, and 7 seconds. Let's do a bit more analysis with the results so far. Venusaur's time I think is largely held back because of my failure to use Swords Dance earlier on. Charizard outperformed Venusaur until Giovanni and stayed very close with Blastoise as well. However, the Rhydon stumped me for far too long, required extra time training and some moveset experimentation. All these factors put Charizard very far behind the other two. Blastoise on the other hand had a slow start, but currently the tortoise seems to be winning the race. Will Agatha wall Venusaur because of her Pokemon's typing? Can Blastoise defeat the champion Jolteon in decent time? Is it possible for Charizard to gain back time and post a competitive time after its serious setback? Well, let's find out. Lorelei is sort of a water type trainer in Generation 1, so you'd think that this helps Venusaur out a lot. Well, you'd be wrong. You might have thought ice moves are super effective against grass types, that's why it's going to be hard. Well, that's actually wrong as well. It's uh, a really easy fight, and that's because all I need is Swords Dance. I put Dugong to sleep with Sleep Powder and then set up three times, maxing out my attack stat and triggering the badge boost glitch three times. This bonus stacks, giving me an additional 42% increase in all my other stats. After that, it's time to sweep with Body Slam. And then, for whatever reason, I get fancy and I use Razor Leaf against Cloyster and Slowbro. Like, seriously Scott, this, this is a really easy fight, just spam Body Slam on everything except Cloyster. I pay the ultimate price at Lapras when its Blizzard connects. I survive, but I get frozen. And now for like the 200th time. In Generation 1, there is no chance for your Pokemon to thaw once frozen. The only way is with an item, which are banned in this challenge or by being hit by a fire move, so Venusaur has to reset for the third time. On the next fight, I still haven't figured out just to use Body Slam, but Razor Leaf gets the job done, and this time I'm moving on to Bruno, the man that never wins. So uh, let me tell you about my girlfriend, and today I'm going to present photographic proof that she exists. So uh, are you ready? Here she is. Uh, yeah, she is really cute. So uh, let's get back to the Bruno fight, right? He is uh, obviously easy because Razor Leaf is a special move and it does more than enough to knock out all of his Pokemon. But Easy League members behind me, it's time for Agatha, and Venusaur really doesn't have a good answer here. My strategy has to be to rely on Sleep Powder to avoid the Hypnosis Dream Eater combo or the final Gengar Psychic. 
I also set up with Swords Dance here. I wanted max attack for the Golbat and Arbok so they don't confuse me or damage me with Wing Attack or Acid. Unfortunately, the Golbat survives because of a critical hit and it confuses me. Golbat survives because of a critical hit, uh, a sentence that only makes sense in Generation 1. This volatile status condition leads Venusaur to hit itself too many times and then I've lost. First loss in the league at Agatha. Alright, I guess that makes sense. On my second fight, I still haven't figured out that using Sword Stance actually increases the damage that I do to myself in Confusion. Probably just avoiding the setup would make this fight more consistent. Because I didn't learn my lesson, Venusaur faints for a second time. Now you'd think I'd figure it out in the next fight, right? But nope, <laughs> I just get carried by Gen 1 sleep and emerge victorious. Lance is last. The fact that he opens with Gyarados really puts me at ease. I put it to sleep and then I set up completely. Again, I'm not sure why I'm using Razor Leaf here, I probably should have just used Body Slam, but eventually I move back to Body Slam and use it against both the Dragonairs and that takes them both out. Aerodactyl time, and this is the moment of truth. But my second setup increased my speed, so I move first and I put it to sleep. Razor Leaf takes care of it over the next following turns and Dragonite is all that remains. Sleep connects and my confidence starts to rise. Body Slam connects and it doesn't do enough damage. At least the Dragon stays asleep and I finish it off next turn. Before the champion, Venusaur has a time of 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 54 seconds. With Charizard's current time, it would have to defeat every trainer on its first attempt to get a faster time than Venusaur, and even then I'm not sure it's possible. So the question here is, how far behind is the fan favorite going to end up? Lorelei's first, and this isn't encouraging. I'm a broken record, but in Generation 1, Fire-type doesn't resist ice, so her water moves and her ice moves are both going to do super effective damage. The problem I'm facing here is that I lack Body Slam and Sword Stance, because of my Giovanni fight earlier. I managed to scrap together a decent fight and arrive at Lapras, but it finishes me off with Blizzard. The second fight is much less encouraging. Cloyster ruins my dreams with Clamp. In fight 3, Slowbro stops me, and then in fight 4 I get back to Lapras, but it finishes me off again. The unfortunate fact is that I'm just making too many mistakes with Charizard, a Pokemon who already doesn't match up well against the League from a type perspective alone, so I'm forced to head back to the region and train. I'll remind everyone now that the first three playthroughs are a chance to see how intuitive the Pokemon feels. For me, Charizard doesn't feel intuitive, and this seems to stem from the simple fact that it gets access to Slash and Sword Stance. These two moves don't work well together because crits cancel out stat buffs. I made a lot of bad decisions because of this. I find Pokemon that only have one good strategy available are actually much more intuitive. When a Pokemon has an overselection of moves, it's much easier to make a mistake and unlearn a key move early on in the run. Uh, in Generation 1, we need like a counter for these statements. Sean, uh, can you like add a counter every time I say in Generation 1? Just like start it at the number that I'm at right now. So here we go. In Generation 1, TMs are single use, there is no move reminder, and there's no move deleter. You need to make the right decision the first time. This leads to a lot of psychological indecision when I'm playing because I want to wait as long as possible to replace moves that I think might be useful in the future. Luckily, playing through the game for a second time with the Pokemon removes all of this indecision. There's a reason that this video is so long. <laughs> oh no. Starting the league at level 61, I still lose to Lorelei. Yeah, this is starting to feel really bad. My internal dialogue at this point was like, maybe I should just like restart and play Charizard all over again. But that feels deceptive, because the first playthroughs are all about seeing what results I can get without experience. Playing the game again to give Charizard better times would go completely against that, and actually give Venusaur and Blastoise a disadvantage. So I have to finish with what I've got, there's no other choice. I'll change up my strategy here. Sword Stance doesn't have to be used in combination with only Body Slam, it can be used with Dig as well. Water and Ice types don't resist ground, so this should be effective against Lorelei. I use Dugong's second turn rest against it and I set up. Once that's complete, I knock it out. In Generation 1, there's a glitch that affects the type effectiveness text that displays in battles. So this is actually dealing neutral damage against the Cloister, despite what the text claims. After that, I use Dig to knock out the remaining three Pokemon. I've done it. It's finally Bruno time. And he's always very easy. I've even left this segment out in previous videos when I felt that there was nothing to say about him. In contrast to Venusaur, Charizard doesn't need to be worried about Agatha either. Access to Flamethrower is all I need. It deals enough damage to knock out most of her Pokemon in a couple hits. Against Golbat, I get poisoned, and this is really good actually. Now her ghost can't put me to sleep. I finish them off and I arrive at Lance. He opens with Gyarados. I use Slash and it does half damage. Hydro Pump connects and does over half damage to Charizard. I survive and I move on. I was really concerned about that part of the fight, but maybe I shouldn't have been. Instead, I should have been scared about what comes next. The next Dragonair has Thunder Wave and Thunderbolt, and that ends my first fight. Okay, let's try again. But this time Gyarados crits with Hydro Pump and finishes me off immediately. And then it happens again. 
On the fourth fight, I start to think differently. What if I use Swords Dance and the Badge Boost glitch to prevent Gyarados from two hitting me? Will that allow me to speed through the rest of the fight? Well, I make a mistake and I do one too many turns of setup and the Gyarados finishes me off again. Ah, <sighs> How many times do I lose this fight? Yeah, well, uh, it's a lot. By my 8th attempt, I am using Rest to heal the status conditions that the Dragonairs can dish out. I am hoping that I sneak in a Swords Dance here and there, but it doesn't work and I'm taking too much damage. I faint again. And then, at this point, I'm getting quite desperate, and I do something that I haven't done in a very, very long time. I'm forced to black out in the League and train more. Here I forgot to deposit my other Pokémon before the League with Charizard, so I have to let them all faint. Uh, if you want to participate in like a really engaging and stimulating debate, we can discuss in the comments if this was actually against the rules. But uh, for the sake of the video, I'm just gonna like roll with it and keep going. After training, Charizard is now level 66, and I'm really hoping that this is all that I need. It's enough for Lorelei of course, so I make it back to Lance. Two slashes for Gyarados, it misses Hydro Pump, two slashes for Dragonair, it uses Thunderbolt and it doesn't paralyze me, so that's perfect. The next Dragonair is a one hit, and then Aerodactyl is next. I get one Swords Dance in before I knock it out. So far, this fight has been really lucky. Dragonite uses Blizzard, gets a critical hit, and knocks Charizard out! Okay. Just like, take a deep breath. Okay, let's try again. And I get back to Dragonite with green health this time. I use Slash, deal less than half damage, and it misses Thunder. And then Lance uses a Hyper Potion on it. The extra time gives Dragonite more attempts to damage me, and Charizard goes down again. That's 24 resets. This is like Pikachu levels of bad, so there must be a way to make this slightly easier. I can trigger the badge boost glitch three times with Sword Stance and raise my special by 42%. That allows me to tank hits from the Dragonite with more confidence, and then I finally finish it off. Charizard gets a time of 1 hour, 52 minutes, and 10 seconds before the champion. So Charizard doesn't even come close to Venusaur's time, but Blastoise was the fastest of all of them to the start of the league. Can the tortoise retain its lead? Is this truly a tortoise and hare scenario playing out before our eyes? Well, uh, Charizard and Venusaur aren't really hares, they're like frogs and lizards. Honestly, all these Pokemon are based on slow animals. Like, look at lizards, they hardly move, they just like sit there. Frogs, I guess they jump around quickly, but like they're really small and they don't go very far. Yeah, I guess if the tortoise wins, it makes sense. Lorelei's first, and with Blastoise, there's a problem here. This is going to be really slow. I've added rest to my moveset so that I have some staying power while I slowly chip away at her Pokemon. While it takes a while, I win my first fight. Bruno. Agatha's next. I like to skip over her fight if my Pokemon knows Earthquake. The ghosts have poor physical defense and are part poison types. I sweep by her with ease and arrive at Lance. I teach Blastoise Blizzard in place of Body Slam so they have an ice move for him. However, I realize right away that this is a mistake. I can't do enough damage to the Gyarados. I can't stall out its powerful moves either because in Generation 1 the AI Pokemon don't have PP. Essentially, they have unlimited PP, something that I desperately wish that I had. As a result, I have to reset, and I think that this one's an easy solution. Instead of replacing Body Slam, I can just replace Rest instead, giving me access to the normal move for Gyarados. I sweep through Lance's team and clock in with a time of 1 hour, 6 minutes, and 35 seconds. The champion opens with Sand Slash, and for Venusaur this is a mixed bag. On one hand it won't use Earthquake, but on the other Slash is going to do a lot of damage. My first Razor Leaf fails, and then I decide to put it to sleep. I, I guess I might as well set up now. Just a note, animations are on now because the game does this automatically to make the champion fight feel more intense. So, in Generation 1, I can't turn them off to save time in this fight. After three sword stances, Razor Leaf misses twice before I finally knock the Sand Slash out. I probably should have just used Body Slam, right? Now, can I sweep? Alakazam's a one-hit, Executor's a one-hit, Cloyster's a one-hit with Razor Leaf, and then Ninetales comes out. For whatever reason, I decided to put it to sleep, and I guess that's a good thing I made this choice because I get a crit with Body Slam and the Fox survives. Jolteon's last. It outspeeds, connects with Pin Missile, but it doesn't do enough damage, and I knock it out. Venusaur clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 17 minutes, and 9 seconds. Going into the champion, Charizard is obviously not in a good place. I'm using Sword Stance for the badge boost glitch because I can't utilize my buffed attack stat with Slash. I really wish I had remembered to grab the TM for like takedown or double edge. I managed to get all the way to Jolteon, but Slash doesn't do quite enough damage and it takes me out with Thunder. This repeats in the second fight. In the third battle against the champion though, I get good luck. Jolteon misses Thunder and I knock it out. 
I clock in with a time of 1 hour 55 minutes and 57 seconds. Honestly, I'm pretty disappointed with this result. Blastoise is last, and can it do it? The champion opens with Sand Slash and Surf knocks it out in one hit. Easy so far. Unfortunately, Alakazam outspeeds, connects with Kinesis, and causes Earthquake to miss two turns in a row. I connect on the third turn, but it doesn't do enough damage, causing me to be taken down just over half health as a result. And then I realize it. Executor is going to spam Leech Seed because it thinks it's super effective. Without a way to heal, the Cloister's up next and things aren't looking good. This mistake is much subtler though than the one that I made with Charizard. I needed to anticipate the Kinesis Leech Seed Cloister wall and plan accordingly. On my third fight, I defeat the Shellfish and I arrive at Jolteon. But it obviously outspeeds and knocks me out with Thunder. Okay, so there are so many ways that Blastoise can fail this fight. Leech Seed into a stall against Cloyster, Kinesis which renders me ineffective for the rest of the fight, Ninetales using Quick Attack if my fight against Cloyster didn't go well, and finally Jolteon can just finish me off with Thunder Wave into Paralysis or Thunder itself. While these losses occurred, I just watched Venusaur's time slowly get closer and closer. It passed me by, and then I continued to slog away with Blastoise. On the 14th fight, I was starting to consider leveling up like Charizard did. I made it to Jolteon with only 13 hit points left, but this felt really hopeless. I was being careless and I spammed Surf again. Jolteon misses Thunder. Surf connects, dealing some damage? Okay, okay. I select Earthquake, it tries Thunder again, misses, and I snap out of confusion and knock it out. Blastoise did it, with a time of 1 hour, 21 minutes, and 51 seconds. Let's summarize these results. Venusaur is the fastest with the least number of resets, but it also ties Blastoise for level of finish. For me, Venusaur was just clearly the most intuitive. There is a clear strategy in Swords Dance, Sleep Powder, Body Slam, and Razor Leaf. And without practice, I achieved a respectable time with it. Blastoise surprised me though, because I expected it to do better. But at the last minute, it got walled by the champion's trolley tactics and Jolteon's speed. Charizard was significantly more difficult than the other two, but that's largely because I played just terribly with it. Overchoice on its moveset in combination with its typing made it the least intuitive for me. Now that I've finished a playthrough with all three Pokemon, I've been able to collect save files from their runs. Before playing my next playthrough, I want to test for consistency against the League. This is going to give me two pieces of important information that will help in planning the next runs. So, the first piece of information is, what level should I aim to be before starting the league? If I want to minimize resets and real time spent playing, of course. Second is, what moveset do I need for each of the league members? I think with this information I'll be able to shave a lot of playtime off each playthrough. In my experience with these playthroughs, I'm typically able to significantly reduce time played and resets on my second attempt. However, any playthroughs beyond that tend to start having diminishing returns set in. I get faster and more consistent, but not always by a large margin. The method I use to test consistency in the league is as follows. I require myself to defeat each league member five times in a row. I'll allow myself to lose once along the way because of a luck-based event like a crit or a freeze, but the second time something like this occurs, I'll just adjust my strategy and start again and try and accumulate five wins in a row. If I lose because of a player error though, I'll keep attempting. The Pokemon isn't inconsistent if I'm the one making the silly mistakes. I'll start with Venusaur. From my previous league run, which was pretty smooth, I think that I mostly have the right idea already. Swords Dance and Body Slam is just the way to go. Pray to Lord Dome, Venusaur. You want his Swords Dancing strength to bless you. Against Lorelei, it doesn't really matter if you use Razor Leaf or Body Slam. I just make sure that I set up three Swords Dances on Dugong to ensure that the Jinx is a one-hit. Against Lapras, I try Body Slam this time, but it isn't a one-hit. So starting the league at level 57 does produce an inconsistency, as Lapras can freeze me with Blizzard, and I can't always one-hit it. However, that's unlikely to occur, and it doesn't happen before I beat her five times. Against Agatha, I can't produce purely consistent results at this level, because I need to rely on Sleep Powder. Luckily, by this point I've figured out that I shouldn't be using Sword Stance here. It's highly likely that I need a significant level increase to get the Ghosts within two-hit range. Even then, that doesn't really improve the consistency that much, because they can still put me to sleep or confuse me. For pure consistency, I'd need to be in range to one hit all of them, and that just isn't realistic. But can I beat her five times in a row with only one unlucky loss at this level? And the answer is yes. She only stops me once because of hypnosis, and then I take my fifth win. For me, this fight's consistent enough. I'm happy having one reset here in the case that I get this unlucky in the future. During the Lance fights, I'm starting to realize just how powerful the combination of Sleep Powder and Body Slam really is. Gyarados doesn't stand a chance of knocking me out because Hyper Beam and Dragon Rage won't do enough damage before I put it to sleep. After that, he's a clean sweep. In my fight against the champion, I'm slightly worried because I don't have rest. I love the safety that that move provides. It just like calms my nerves. 
My first fight is so tense, I beat the Jolteon with only a small sliver of health remaining. However, then fights 2, 3, 4, and 5 all turn out significantly better. This suggests that the first fight, which was close, was actually the outlier, and it's far more likely for me to be able to defeat him with ease. I'm confident now saying that Venusaur won't need to be more than level 57 to start the league, and this moveset is all that it requires. Growth and Leech Seed obviously aren't great, so I can just ditch them as soon as I get Sword Stance in the future. With Charizard, I originally started the league at level 57, but that just isn't going to work. When I returned to the league, I was level 61, and that allowed me to win. So for the consistent league test, I want to go in a little bit higher because it still didn't feel great with Charizard. So I choose level 63 today. I'm also bringing Body Slam this time. I'll leave Slash behind in order to defeat Giovanni. Lorelai is still rough. She almost knocks Charizard out in most of these fights, but Sword Stance is just slightly too strong. I win five times in a row. So this fight doesn't feel good, but it works. Lance is the next threat. I'm going into this fight at level 65 after leveling up on Bruno and Agatha. I win the first fight with the use of Sword Stance into Body Slam, but the second fight I get taken down by the Dragonite after it survives my Body Slam. Okay, so uh, that wasn't luck. I level up and try again at level 67, and this time his first Dragonair stops me with its status conditions. Okay, so time to level up more. At level 70 I try again, and Charizard is still able to lose. Obviously this fight is possible, I'm actually winning much more than I'm losing, but unfortunately it just isn't meeting my criteria for consistency yet. I tried a rest moveset at level 70 to see if it would solve the problem, but unfortunately it doesn't. Finally, all the way at level 76, I'm able to defeat him five times in a row. The main reason this works is that I tank his attacks better, and I'm able to one-shot all of his Pokémon once I'm set up. The thing about having to level up this much for Lance, though, is that it makes the champion trivial. I smash through him with ease and take five victories. It's time for Blastoise. I'm deciding to test Lorelei just because of how slow this fight is against her. In long fights, it's often the case that unpredictable things like crits and luck play more of a role. Also, I leveled up once because the champion was wildly inconsistent last time, and like maybe one additional level might help. While I was fighting Lorelei, I actually do end up losing because of luck, and in this case it's because Slowbro got a critical hit with Psychic. Well, that's really lucky, like its base speed is just not good. After that, I win four more times in a row, and that's good enough. Against Lance, I run into a problem. Blizzard isn't accurate enough. In Generation 1, it has a 90% accuracy, but missing just once is enough to completely throw Blastoise off. The solution is obviously to save Ice Beam for this fight. With 100% accuracy, I'm able to win 5 times in a row and move on to the champion. Now it's time to figure out how to manage the Jolteon. I try to use Mimic on Earthquake so that I can use it against the Ninetales and the Jolteon. I lose the first fight because of Thunder Wave and Thunder at the very end. Earthquake just didn't quite get the job done. I tried something radical next. What if Blastoise starts the fight at level 70? This is a big level jump. You'd think that this would outspeed the Jolteon because of all the stat experience I've built up, but this isn't the case and the Punk Rock Doggo can still knock me out with Thunder occasionally. So how do we do it? Well, Mimic on Sandslash to steal Earthquake is a pretty good move, and then at level 72 I'm outspeeding the Jolteon and I one hit it with Earthquake. So that's good enough for 5 wins in a row. To recap my consistent league test, Venusaur needed almost no adjustments and it can easily defeat the league if it starts at level 57. Charizard needs way more levels to achieve consistency because of Lance. Level 76 is just so high and it just doesn't make sense to train that much in a speed run. I need to be a higher level than last time, but training to this level is just too much of a sacrifice to make, so I'll have to take some risks in that playthrough. I think I'll be able to win after 2 or 3 fights anyways at a lower level. Blastoise also requires a high level for consistency against the champion. I'm less confident with it against the Jolteon, but the possibility of Thunder Wave and still moving with Earthquake is there, so I'll probably have to fish for a lucky victory. So Venusaur is the fastest Pokemon in the first playthrough, and it achieves consistency in the league with the greatest ease. Now with all this information and learning, will the results repeat? How much time can I save in each playthrough? Is there a possibility that Charizard can become competitive, or will Venusaur take a second victory? Let's find out. The next playthrough I did, I also forced the Pokemon to face the rival's Jolteon team again. We'll get to the Flareon and Vaporeon teams in the future, don't worry. The issue with Bulbasaur and the Brock split was the optional rival's Spearow. This time on my second playthrough, this fight doesn't go as well as it did previously, but I realized that at Eevee I can use Leech Seed to give myself a bit more time. Now I'm only losing one hit point per turn, dramatically extending the battle and that allows me to win on my first attempt. Brock is once again a cakewalk, and I clock in with a time of 11 minutes and 21 seconds. That's 20 seconds slower than my previous playthrough. 
for Charmander to stumble onto some unfortunate luck against the optional rival. Like, look at this ridiculous sand attack. I was so frustrated. At least I defeat him on the second fight, and I stomp my way past Brock, clocking in with a time of 7 minutes and 6 seconds. Almost a full minute slower than my first playthrough. Squirtle's lab battle goes so poorly. I need to win this in order to face Jolteon, so if I lose here I need to reset, but I luck out right at the perfect moment and I proceed. Okay, good. With Squirtle I lost against the optional rival previously, so I train up to level 10 instead of level 9 this time. You'd think that this made the fight much easier, but that isn't the case. Sand attack really messes with me and I get taken down to red health. I was so sure that I was going to lose here, but then again at the last minute I get lucky and I defeat him. So it happened again, two lucky rival fights right at the beginning. I'm really glad that I'm moving on. After that Brock is easy and I clock in with a time of 7 minutes and 35 seconds, 12 seconds slower than before. Looking at all these results it seems like I'm off to a bad start, but believe me, the real optimizations are still coming. For Squirtle it can skip heals in Pewter City, outside of Mount Moon, and in Cerulean until after it defeats Misty. This is because it has fabulous PP. Bubble Beam, Water Gun, Tackle, Bite, and Mega Punch all combine to give a great PP reserve that Squirtle can really tap into and use to smash its way through this entire section of the game. And uh, I just want to mention, yes, I didn't forget Mega Punch this time, I'm really proud of myself. Uh, additionally, with Mega Punch on my side, I can take Misty on before journeying south to Vermilion. Remember, she has good AI, so the only damage dealing move she has is Tackle, and War Turtle's defense is really great. I clock in 2 minutes and 44 seconds faster. But that time is largely because of the SSN, so after Surge is defeated I'm actually slightly slower than my first attempt still. I am one level higher though. From here on I'm able to play to the data that I collected in my first playthrough and avoid attempting fights before I know I can win. I defeat every significant leader from here on out without resetting. And then I arrive at the final rival. Surf for Sandslash, Ice Beam for Execute, Surf for Ninetales, unfortunately Surf for Cloister too. It confuses me as a result of taking so much time to knock it out, but I snap out of it before I move on to the Kadabra, who is an easy one-shot with Body Slam. Jolteon's last. It moves first, uses Thunder, and knocks Blastoise out. Oh no, am I going to get walled here? I try the fight again, and Jolteon's Thunder knocks me out for a second time. Alright, alright, I need more levels, I don't think I want to attempt this again. At level 56 I make it back to Jolteon, and this time it uses Thunder Wave, and that lets me use Earthquake and knock it out. Blastoise clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 3 minutes and 26 seconds as his pre-league time, so that's a little bit slower than last time. For Bulbasaur, I clock in with nearly identical times from Misty to Koga. However, from here you can see that I know what's up. Swords Dance and Body Slam. All day, baby. Pray to the Dark Lord, let him bless us with your sword dancing powers. He, maybe he can, like, give you the blessing of the scythe hands. Venusaur gets a time of 1 hour, 9 minutes, and 4 seconds at the pre-league time. It seems as if I've lost around a minute of time somewhere, but I've traded that time for levels. I'm 2 levels higher this time. In the Charizard playthrough is where I was able to make the most improvements to my play, because let's face it, the first run was completely awful. The cornerstone of my new strategy is overleveling earlier on before attempting the hardest fights of the run. This is going to save so much reset time. At Surge, I'm slightly slower than my previous run, and the fight doesn't go very well. I was like worried that I had to reset here, but I pull through and I move on. In the mid game, the key is Flamethrower before the rival in Sylph. Once I've got it, I'm able to defeat him with ease. Now it's all about planning for the Giovanni fight, and this time I want to arrive there at a high level, 59 to be exact, and that's a higher level than I was previously when I started the league. I use Body Slam on Doug Trio and knock it out. Persian's next. It survives, but Giovanni uses a guard spec. Okay, so that's a free team member. Nidoqueen also survives, hits me with Thunder, which doesn't do much, and then I knock it out. Nidoking's next, and Dig knocks it out in a single hit. Right on, the only barrier is last. I use Dig, deal more than half damage, and then the rocks fall and Charizard faints. That's the first reset since the optional rival. I'm proud to be able to play that consistently, honestly, but Giovanni is just really tough. I could have anticipated the need for Reflect though. Dugtrio provides me a moment to set it up at the start of the fight, but will it allow me to survive Rhydon's rock slide? I get hit, I survive with red health, and I knock the Rhino out. I speed through the final rival's team and arrive at Indigo Plateau achieving a pre-league time of 1 hour, 12 minutes, and 0 seconds. So that's pretty comparable to last time, but I am 4 levels higher. Of the league members, Venusaur only needs to worry about Agatha. Swords Dance, Body Slam, and Razor Leaf lead to swift victories against Lorelei and Bruno. Well, Bruno is Bruno after all, I never lose to him. Ever. Agatha opens with Gengar. I miss my first sleep powder, but my second one connects, and I start to whittle it down. Before I finish, she switches for Golbat, and I get sleep powder off right away. Okay, good. 
I start to set up Swords Dance, which is probably a bad move because of confusion, like, come on. But then Gengar comes back out and I put it to sleep and knock it out. I just need to pray that Hypnosis isn't going to connect. I get first turn luck against Haunter and then knock it out without it doing anything. Arbok faints to a single hit and the final Gengar goes to sleep right away. But Razorleaf really isn't doing much. I'll need time. And I get it. And Agatha's defeated with that. Against Lance, I take a slightly different approach. I Razorleaf the Gyarados down immediately, put the Dragonair to sleep, set up on it with Swords Dance, and then start the sweep. Aerodactyl's next. And Sleep Powder misses. Okay, I had that coming. It uses Fly, I take a lot of damage, and then Sleep Powder works. Dragonite's last, and I should have just knocked it out with Body Slam, but I put it to sleep first. So that's a bit risky, but I take the victory anyways. No losses in the league. It's been a clean sweep so far. Can Venusaur do it against the champion? Okay, here's the strat. Actually, should I even describe the strat? Because it's like, sleep powder into swords dance. <laughs> the thing I love about this strategy is just how consistent it feels. Sand Slash really can't do anything catastrophic, and that gives me the time to put it to sleep and set up. After that, it's time to sweep. Body Slam for Alakazam, Body Slam for Executor, Razor Leaf for Cloister, and that leads to Ninetales. Despite it being a fire type, I'm not scared, I outspeed, and I one-hit it. Last is Jolteon, and even with a 5 turn critical hit pin missile, I think I would have survived. It doesn't get that, I connect with Body Slam, and I've done it. 1 hour, 14 minutes, and 48 seconds. 2 minutes and 21 seconds faster than my previous playthrough. It's a marginal gain, but I did have 4 less resets, so I'm pretty happy with it. Charizard is next. I'm starting Lorelei 6 levels higher than before at roughly the same time. Dugong's where I want to set up. I use Body Slam first turn to damage it, and in a strange turn of events, it doesn't use Rest second turn. That's really frustrating. I was just trying to prove all the Charizard fans out there that their boy can get a good time. Stop messing with me, AI. I use Sword Stance twice, and then Dugong's Aurora Beam lowers my attack and puts me in range of KO. Okay, it's now or never, I need to sweep. Flamethrower connects with Cloyster, gets a critical hit, and it does it. Slowbro and Jinx both faint in a single hit, leading to Lapras. Please, just faint to a single hit. But it hangs on at red health. And then Lorelei uses a super potion. Yes! <laughs> okay, I did it. The next challenge is Lance. Charizard could lose all the time I've gained here though because I'm playing slightly risky and disregarding my consistent league test. After all, leveling up that much just isn't realistic. First turn, Gyarados gets a massive Hydro Pump off, dealing almost half damage to me. The badge boost glitch really helped me here because I tanked one hit just a little bit better with it. I use Body Slam hoping for a knockout, but I don't get it. Gyarados goes for Hydro Pump again, but it misses and faints as a result. Dragonair is next, and here I make a choice that makes me have some anxiety even watching this footage back two months later after I played it. Another sword stance? This thing could paralyze me with Thunder Wave. So that was really risky, but it pays off as I survive Thunderbolt and knock it out. I'm moving on status condition free. I sweep the next one, Aerodactyl survives Body Slam, uses Fly, misses, faints, and Body Slam seals the deal. First fight against Lance is a win. I needed the Hydro Pump to miss and the Fly to miss too, so it did involve a lot of luck. Charizard's posting a really respectable time though, so I'm happy. It might actually clock in faster than Venusaur's round 1 time, but it won't be able to beat the improved round 2 time. The champion opens with Sand Slash, and here I want to set up Swords Dance 3 times. Once that's complete, I use Flamethrower to knock the Shrew out. Body Slam takes care of Alakazam, and Flamethrower manages both Executor and Cloister that follow. I've got Dig for Ninetales and Jolteon, both of which I outspeed leading to a fast and efficient victory. 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 1 second. I did it. I clocked in with a faster time with Charizard on the second round than Venusaur got in the first round. After the dismal performance in my first playthrough, I think that this is an adequate redemption, even though it didn't get Charizard the round 2 win. Blastoise is last. The slow Lorelei fight is first. While writing scripting and reflecting on this footage two months after it was recorded, I am thinking that maybe keeping Dig for longer, replacing it with Submission for this fight, and then replacing it with Earthquake after this fight's over might be a small improvement. However, that does require me to teach my Pokémon Submission. I, uh, I think I need to add another rule. I will never teach my Pokémon Submission. <laughs> it's so bad! You'll notice that at Lance I decided to go against my consistent league advice and use Blizzard instead. This gets me into a scary scenario where Aerodactyl uses Fly. When it's up in the air, I miss, and that's that. Now I've got PP problems. I use Surf instead, survive the Fly, and knock it out. I've got to connect with Blizzard now on the Dragonite. I do, and I'm moving on to the Champion. My heart was pounding because Blastoise is making fantastic time. Surf takes out Sand Slash, and Earthquake manages Alakazam over two turns. No Kinesis this time. 
Blizzard is a two hit against Executor, which unfortunately allows it to set up Leech Seed. Now the pain begins. But I'm a higher level than last time, and with a critical hit starting things off, I manage the Cloister with only three turns, letting me one shot the Ninetales and arrive at Jolteon with full health. Now I pray. This is all luck. It uses Thunder Wave, that's what I needed, and I still move, connecting with Earthquake and take the victory. Blastoise clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 9 minutes, and 20 seconds. I'm really happy with these results. Now let's do a tiny bit of analysis. The fact that Venusaur clocked in with a time so similar to its time it got in round 1 really cements the fact that it's the most intuitive out of the three. There just weren't very many efficiencies to add in the second playthrough. Charizard on the other hand was largely botched on the first round because it was hard to figure out, and this time I was able to reduce its time significantly. It's 39 minutes and 55 seconds faster with 24 less resets. Blastoise also got a major reduction in time. I do have to say that while I improved its performance, the champion fight was largely luck. So Venusaur takes round 1 and the consistent league, gets second place in round 2, and Blastoise achieves the lowest time yet in all of these playthroughs. This isn't enough for me to feel confident in announcing a winner though, because Venusaur has been playing with its hands behind its back this entire time. I've been forcing it to fight the optional rival at the start when it doesn't have to. What happens when I make each of these Pokemon face the rival's team when he chooses Flareon? Let's find out. Okay, uh, just a brief intermission. I should uh, check in with everyone. How y'all doing? Um, go take care of yourself, you know, like get some chips, some water, uh, maybe use the washroom. This is a long video after all. If you're uh, watching this late at night, maybe like pass out and then like resume it in the morning. Uh, you can always let it auto play all my playlists. That's a, uh, yeah, that's really fun for me. You also may have noticed that in round two, I spent significantly less time on each of the playthroughs and that's going to continue going forward because I don't want to waste your time. So here are the key things that came up that were of note during the Flareon playthrough for each Pokemon. Because we're skipping the optional rival, Bulbasaur is able to face the bug catchers in Viridian Forest. After all, trainer Pokemon give 1.5 times the experience that wild Pokemon give. This allows it to arrive at Brock at level 13 and have Vine Whip. You'd probably be able to win with Leech Seed only, but I don't really want to try that. Vine Whip is good enough. That allows me to earn a much faster time of 7 minutes and 39 seconds. So from here now, things are like essentially identical. I do manage to get small efficiency gains from time to time here and there, like bumping into less walls and stuff like that. Uh, Rival Fievel is the first time that I get to test Venusaur against Flareon. Sandslash still leads, which means I have to set up Swords Dance. Razor Leaf manages Cloister. Body Slam takes care of Magneton and Kadabra. Flareon's last. And here's why it makes so much more sense for Venusaur to face this team. Flareon is slow. Venusaur moves first with Body Slam and it one hits the doggo. I thought maybe it might play out differently in the final rival fight, but I still move first here with Body Slam and I take it down. I've arrived at the league with no resets, with a time of 1 hour, 3 minutes and 18 seconds. 5 minutes and 46 seconds faster than round 2. That's a major reduction of time which came primarily from the Brock split. The league goes as I expect it would. Lots of swords dance and lots of winning. I defeat Agatha first attempt. Lance is the same as always. I set up on Gyarados and then I sweep. But Aerodactyl outspeeds with wing attack, gets a crit and does so much damage. Yikes. At least Dragonite's going to be an easy one hit with body slam. But wait, it, it isn't? It uses Blizzard and Venusaur feints. So the first reset is at Lance, and it ruined my perfect run with that awful luck. But it doesn't ruin my time because I defeat Lance on the very next fight and I move on. Against the champion, I'm not worried. I can just set up and sweep like I always do. Flareon's slow, so I outspeed it, and with that I've won. I get a time of 1 hour, 8 minutes and 15 seconds in round 3, with only one reset. That's the new king of the hill for fastest game time completion in this video. So can Charizard take its spot? Let's find out. One immediate advantage for it is that it's already capable of getting an incredibly fast Brock split. Removing the need for the optional rival only speeds this up and allows it to clock in at 5 minutes and 55 seconds. So this is the fastest Brock split so far. From there I mirror my other playthroughs. Mega Punch, Body Slam before Misty, and then the prioritization of training in the mid game to obtain Flamethrower before Koga and the Sylph rival. Here we get to see how Charizard goes up against his team that includes Flareon. You'll notice that I'm very over leveled here, so this fight's really easy. Charizard's speed in combination with Dig makes Flareon trivial. But the first major obstacle for Charizard was never this rival, it's Giovanni. The first fight against him I set up completely with Swords Dance against Doug Trio. The only move that it knows that can actually do something to me is Sand Attack. Unfortunately it gets me on the last turn before I knock it out. This is the reason that I lose this fight actually. I miss against the final Rhydon with Dig twice. I even survived his Rock Slide, so like, okay, whatever, I'll do that again. 
On the next fight, Dig connects and right on faints with a single hit. So the reason that I wasn't using the strategy that I'd used before here with Reflect is that I was just a much higher level and I thought that I could do it with only attacking moves. I steamroll the final rival and I attempt the league starting at level 64. Lance is the obvious place to talk about because he's the hardest for Charizard. When watching this footage I realize that I'm kind of being stubborn here. I could give up Dig at this point and take Rest with me instead. That causes me to lose twice against the Aerodactyl. Okay, third fight's the charm, right? Well, this time Gyarados lands two Hydro Pumps taking me down to red health. I sweep through his team and arrive at Aerodactyl. Oh no, not again. It uses wing attack, hits me, and Charizard survives with one hit point. Hype. I knock it out, and Dragonite's next. Body Slam connects, and it survives. But Lance uses a retroactive potion and heals it. I've got another shot, but it survives again and uses Blizzard but it misses. So in what is likely the best and worst luck yet, Charizard's moving on to the champion in round three. I'm lucky because this fight is easy. I just set up here and I sweep. It's completely simple. Flareon even sets up Reflect before my dig connects, but I still take it down in a single hit. Charizard gets a time of one hour, 14 minutes and 17 seconds. That's my best time with the fire starter, but it just isn't competitive with Venusaur's round three time. It's time for Blastoise, and against Flareon, there like, isn't much to say. Like, what do you want me to say? <laughs> At the final rival fight, I was worried about Magneton, but I outspeed it with Dig and I take it down. Uh, this is obviously easy mode for Blastoise after all. I make it all the way to the champion without a single reset. I've never done a challenge playthrough without at least one reset, so maybe today is the day for a perfect run? I knock Executor out after it sets up Leech Seed and I move on to Magneton. And then my heart sinks. It survives Earthquake and paralyzes me. Oh no, that isn't good. I use Earthquake hoping to finish it off after I survive its Thunderbolt, but it gets a critical hit and knocks Blastoise out. No perfect run for me today. In the next fight, Magneton survives again, but this time it uses Thunderbolt instead of Thunder Wave. And yikes, Blastoise takes so much damage, but it survives with 30 hit points. I knock the bolts out and I move on to Cloyster. Here I heal with rest, and the fight slows down significantly because of the nuisance that is Leech Seed. This move is awful. I knock it out eventually, and I move on to Flareon. Surf should do it right. Well, no it doesn't, but Flareon can't do much damage to me, so I heal and finish it off clocking in with a time of 1 hour, 5 minutes, and 54 seconds. Blastoise gets the fastest time so far of any of these playthroughs, but that was probably to be expected here. Only one scenario remains to be tested. Honestly, I consider just skipping it entirely because it's so weird to intentionally test it. To force the rival to choose Vaporeon as his Eevee's final form, you must lose the fight with him in the lab. Why would you want to lose in the lab? It seems so counterintuitive, especially because you don't get experience and then you have to start training for Brock starting at level 5. I think that from what I've tested, I'd just play against Flareon if I wanted the fastest possible result, or play against Jolteon if I wanted the maximum difficulty. But in the name of being thorough, I'll test Vaporeon and force each of these cuties to lose in the lab. I'm really sorry. <laughs> By the way, I'm not counting the lab loss as a reset, normally I count blackouts, but this technically isn't a blackout, you're allowed to just keep playing after it. So now let's look at Venusaur's splits throughout this playthrough. It's almost identical to the Flareon playthrough. I did lose some time early on, but my newfound experience helps me out in the mid game and I gain that time back arriving at the league only 12 seconds slower than previously. I was so close to another perfect playthrough here too, but Lance had something to say about that. I miss Sleep Powder first turn, he uses Fly, I miss again next turn, because I didn't think I'd survive at this point, I used Body Slam and just like crossed my fingers and hoped, but it doesn't work and I faint. Perhaps if I had just used Sleep Powder once more, I think then I would have been able to do it. I'm sort of kicking myself for this one. After the next Lance fight, I'm able to sweep the champion again. Vaporeon really doesn't change anything for Venusaur. The Flareon route is just better in the early game, but I guess it's good to know that you don't need to reset if you lose the initial lab fight by accident. Against Vaporeon, Blastoise does just as well as Flareon. I managed to get to the champion without a single reset. I'd say I've got these playthroughs locked down now. Things are feeling really smooth and predictable. The champion's team is slightly inconsistent because of Magneton, of course. Blastoise can't achieve this low of a time and enough damage to knock it out in a single hit. There might be some potential with Withdraw and Badge Boost strats here, but this is good enough for me today. It hits me with Thunderbolt, takes me down to 17 hit points, and with that I did it. I made it to Vaporeon. I'll just heal and then I'll knock it out. Ah, uh, oh wait, it uses Quick Attack? And it gets a critical hit and finishes Blastoise off. Like, come on, that was my last shot at a perfect run. Ah, uh, because there's no way that Charizard is going to pull it off, right? In the next fight, Magneton rolls a better range, and Blastoise faints again. 
But the third fight, I survive, make it to Vaporeon with enough health to survive Quick Attack. I heal up, and I knock it out over three turns with Earthquake. Blastoise clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 3 minutes, and 28 seconds. That's the new fastest time of this video. Blastoise is just setting records all day, and truly the tortoise with cannons is faster than the frog dinosaur flower and the fire lizard. You're probably saying, but uh, what about Charizard's playthrough against Vaporeon? It still has a chance. Uh, well, yes, I, I guess it does. <laughs> Uh, I get to Giovanni with no resets. Uh, so far, so good. I set up on Doug Trio and then I start my sweep. But you'll notice that I have Fire Spin on my moveset instead of Dig. So my thought was that maybe I can just use my speed to defeat the Rhydon and to also defeat Lance's Gyarados. But Fire Spin's awful accuracy quickly convinces me that this is not a good choice. I fail once more this way and then I abandon Fire Spin forever in favor of Flamethrower. I kept passing over this move as I was playing these playthroughs and I was like, well, I should probably try it out to see if it's a good option. Unfortunately for Charizard, things don't get better from here. Vaporeon knocks it out in the final rival fight with a Hydro Pump. Then Lorelei's Dugong forgets to use Rest and knocks it out. And uh, finally, I struggle against Lance, as always, losing a total of three times before I manage to defeat him. As I was playing this playthrough, I genuinely felt like the game was trying to ruin Charizard's day. Pokemon Yellow is just like whispering in its ear like, Hey, you think everyone loves you? Ah, uh, yeah, well they don't. My whole purpose as a game is to take fan favorites like Pikachu and Charizard and put them through the self-esteem grinder. I hope you hate me. I end up losing two times to the champion as well, finally finishing him off clocking in with a time of 1 hour, 13 minutes, and 13 seconds. Funny enough, after all that awful play and awful luck, Charizard gets its fastest time so far, against Vaporeon. Out of all three evolutionary lines, I still think I have the most room to improve with Charizard, and it would be nice to eventually get it a sub 1 hour and 10 minute time, but that isn't going to happen today. Here's the results. Venusaur was the fastest Pokemon in round 1 with the least number of resets, and tied for the lowest level finish. It also got a respectable 4 hours and 47 minutes game time, which was only beat by Blastoise who got 4 hours and 27 minutes, largely because it had to reset so much against the champion. In round 2, Blastoise edged out Venusaur by taking the fastest time. All three Pokemon tied for a number of resets, that's kinda cool, and with the low number of resets comes a fairly consistent game time with Blastoise also being the fastest in this metric. Venusaur was the lowest level here, but only by a margin of 1, with Charizard having to rely on overleveling to finish. In round 3, the results from round 2 are mirrored, but everything was slightly better, with Venusaur taking an outsized advantage because of the freedom that facing Flareon provided it in the Brock split. Finally, in round 4, Blastoise once again took the win, this time with the fastest time of the entire video, two resets and finishing the game at level 62. During my consistent league test, I discovered that Venusaur has the easiest time with the league, despite its type disadvantage against Agatha. The champion's team in yellow is just a bit too strong for Blastoise and Charizard to finish him off at a low level consistently. So who wins? I think today it's Blastoise. It got the best time 3 out of 4 attempts, and all 3 of those attempts were after I had practiced. Its resets are in the same league as Venusaur's being tied in round 2 and 3, and only edged out by 1 in the final round. It gets a faster game time, and it also beats the game at the same level range as Venusaur. It's worth mentioning that Venusaur takes an extremely close second place to it though. Its strength is consistency. If you're doing a solo Nuzlocke, I'd choose it. If I was competing for the fastest completion time, I'd choose Blastoise. That's probably why a lot of speedrunners use it. Unfortunately, Charizard is a distant third place. However, it does win the award for the most improved playthrough. Now, just before I conclude, I want to mention J Rose 11. He was one of my main inspirations when I started making these videos. A lot of you comment on my videos, sharing comparisons between his videos and mine, and I wanted to address these comments so that you have all the information. First of all, he plays his challenges in Pokemon Red. The number of differences between red and yellow are staggering, but they're mostly small details and they're easily overlooked. Like Giovanni's gym team, in red and blue he's honestly awful and would be a piece of cake for Charizard to take on, but in yellow he's terrifying and really messes up Charizard's time. Second, while I believe j plays on 4 times speed like me, he is aiming for fastest in-game time of completion, and this metric works very differently than real time. To optimize for fastest in-game time completion, you want to find the minimum level to defeat every foe because you aren't worried about how many times you need to reset. I personally prioritize real time, and so this ends up playing out quite differently in my videos. 
I like this metric just because it shows you how long it took me to beat the game. And for me, I was always trying to say like, how long would this take me if I just played this challenge on a Sunday? Because not everyone has unlimited time to reset like 300 times. It's been fun for me to learn the difference between these two approaches and slowly come to understand how my videos are a bit different from his. Just remember, I'm not doing Pokemon science. Uh, in the end, all of this is just for fun. And uh, I just want there to be more Pokemon content out there for everyone to have. Also, I love you, J-Rose. Thanks so much for all the Pokemon content and all the hard work over the years. So earlier this week, I released a video where I ranked all my previous Kanto playthroughs into a tier list. Here it is the first Kanto tier list on this channel. This is a subjective list, I'm not actually ranking these based on the metrics, more on how I feel and how the metrics play into how I feel. Blastoise and Venusaur are great Pokemon, so this is where they fit, and Charizard is a bit further down because honestly it kind of struggles in Kanto. I intend to play through Pokemon Yellow with every single Pokemon, so here's my challenge decks. I've filled in Ivysaur, Venusaur, Charmeleon, Charizard, Wartortle, and Blastoise today. I left their first stages blank intentionally though. Now we've reached the end of this monster. It has been such a huge undertaking to bring this together, and now I have some key thanks. First of all, I want to thank my video editor Sean for his help. Honestly, he's kept the channel running while I've been recovering from burnout, so give him a big round of applause with some really friendly comments. Next, I want to say thank you to Serena for all her excellent illustrations. Now my girlfriend Sean, Greg, Serena, and me all have a physical appearance on the channel. It's a small team, but I think together we can create some really awesome content for all of you, so I'm really happy that all these people have an avatar for the channel. Coming up tomorrow will be my first Generation 3 video. I am excited to start tackling a new region and discovering all of its secrets. But it's gonna be a bumpy road, because believe me, every time I start a new region, it's been bumpy before. So tune in and leave me a comment to help me learn. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and leave a comment because I gotta read them all. This video is brought to you by the generous support of my patrons. If you want to be like them and be one of the Pokemon in the credits and gain access to a private Discord server where we all hang out and have really cool emotes, consider supporting me for as little as $2 a month. Now, it's bloopers time. I also have the idea of creating something called a cumula- I also have something- Oh my god, I can't say cumula- Cumulative. Cumulative. So Charizard's weak to Vaporeon and Jolteon, and that's because Vaporeon's water type and Jolteon's a thunder type. Thunder type. Oh my gosh, what am I saying? Charizard should face. Ch Charizard should face. Ha. Charizard. Ch Charizard should face Flareon. Charizard should face. Face. Charizard should face Flareon. Blastoise should face. The problem with his team here is that his initial peer. The problem with his team is that his initial Spiro knows spec. Spec. Ah. The problem with his team is that his initial Sparrow knows spec. Spec. Ah. Oh no. <laughs> ah. I was like, I'm doing so well. I read like four lines in a row without making a mistake, and then I just like couldn't do this line. War turtle burtles. Burtles. Ah. Oh, and then a burp. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Fell apart. Oh, another burp. Fell apart during that line. And the blooper, I guess. I haven't got the soul or volc. I haven't got the soul or vol volcano. Volcano. I steamroll Giovanni next, do some training in the fighting dojo to raise my level even more, and then I head head and then I head head to head with what the heck? Head 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 head. She loves to use X Defend or Reflect with Alakazam, and I can bypass the blah, blah. Rock moves do four times damage to Charizard because they're super effective against both fire and fighting and fighting moves. Then piss piss missile. <laughs> no. I try to face Sabrina first, for this is the fight that I I decide to face Sabrina. And for the thousandth, and, and for now like the thousandth, thousandth, oh I can't say that word. The fact that he opens with Gyarados, <laughs> the fact that he, oh my gosh I can't, Gyarados, <laughs> it's like, there's like two THs in that Gyarados. The ghosts have pur, 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 I did it again, pur physical defense, pur, it's like a Dr. Evil physical defense, pur physical defense.